That's right. We promised to you uh, OB2, OBT2, and we are there here. There you go. As I stumble over my words. I'll tell you who didn't stumble at his bro day. Professional segue. It is Bo Nix. Nice. Is Bo Nix the guy, Mace? Like, we, we look at all these options for the Broncos and move up for Drake May, move up for J.J. McCarthy, because they're going to have to for both of those players. But Bo Nix will probably be there at 12. I think he's a top 15 pick. I think he has first-round duels. I have him graded higher than J.J. McCarthy. So are we... Mm -hmm collectively just kind of overlooking a guy that may be a perfect fit for Sean Payton. Possibly. He doesn't have all the tools on his tool belt. You'd like it if he could push the ball down the field more. I don't make too much of the whole greatest completion percentage in FBS history because let's face it, there's a lot of short of short to intermediate stuff. But that being said, he does have this metronomic consistency on the short to intermediate stuff. Think last year how many times you saw Russell Wilson miss a running back in the flat. Mm -hmm. The thing you can say about Bo Nix is he doesn't miss those. Right. And I will say not this very means, often. As a former high school quarterback, I sound it sounds so lame. A screen pass was hard to hit. Guy standing there, it's somewhat close. It's usually with the defense coming at you, like because you have to lure the defense in. Mm -hmm. And of Bo yep. Nix's passing attempts last year, 150 at uh, zero rate. This is from the great Mike Tanier. So look at his sub stack yeah. 150 at zero or behind the line of scrimmage. Those mm -hmm. micro passes, 143 yeah. of those were complete. That's a tougher throw than people think. Now, when you talk about how many throws are at or behind the line of scrimmage, there are going to be people who say, well, that was a critique of Russell Wilson too much behind or, you know, or behind the line of scrimmage or at the line of scrimmage. Right. But Russell Wilson was missing some, was missing some of those from time to time. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, you, you speak of the screen passes, you do have to draw the defender to you. And if you are a Russell Wilson type, who is looking to escape the pocket outside, they're not going to rush you with the same vigor. And then they're going to play back a little bit, and that's going to cut into the lanes that a target on those plays is going to have. Of course, the other issue is when you tried those screen passes to Joel McLaughlin, McLaughlin was getting the ball, for a while there, 70% of the time he was on the field. So that was a tell. And so that's something you have to work on too. Yes. But yeah, the, the, you know, it's, it's intriguing now to think about Bo Nix and to think about what he could do in the rhythm and timing elements, because 95% of what Sean Payton's going to ask of his quarterback, keeping you on schedule Bo Nix is going to be able to do. Again, you're concerned a little about the deep outside stuff, but he'll use the middle of the field. He'll work the screen game. There's, you know, I think it's just that maybe because he's so metronomic and how he goes about things, and also you're looking at the transition schematically from Oregon's offense to the NFL. It's right. a different game. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to spread teams out horizontally pre-snap in the same way that you can at Oregon. That's a con that's a concern too. You are making a projection, but accuracy on trans transfer for the most part. Yeah, and pass placement, which is never a problem for Bo Nix. So, mm -hmm. yeah, with Sean Payton, I think it looked pretty good. Mace, there's a couple of reasons why I like Bo Nix. If you sit mm -hmm. at twelve, uh, I say his attitude. He's got some fire. We've talked about that. I like that. And I also look at the fact that you get a guy that's not a robot per se but will be system sound. And if mm -hmm. you're Sean Payton and you want someone that's a conductor of what you've written for your orchestra of an offense, Bo Nix can be that conductor. Exactly. And you, Hey, you said metronome. It, I'm thinking about music. It, no, but I think that's accurate, right? Like, you know, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, right? That's uh, when I watch Bo Nix, it's, it's a rhythm, right? It's a consistent rhythm that he gets into. Mm -hmm. That's his strength. He does have some mobility, can take off and make plays if it's not there. 
I come back to the senior bowl where I thought he did struggle to diagnose things downfield. But as I've said before, you maybe give that a pass because he's working with new receivers and they did not take the time in practice seven on seven to get the timing right, which I think affected him as he found himself under a heavy rush, especially in those first two days of practice that we saw down in Mobile. So this is going to be one of those things where you say, okay, it's the film and the body of work more than what happened in that particular week that you're going by. And even though a lot of people, a lot of mock drafts don't have Bo Nix in round one, the clamor for quarterbacks is such that I think he will end up being in round one. And if you really believe Bo Nix can run this offense and you're Sean Payton, don't trade down and roll the dice. Maybe you can get him. No, just, just make the pick. If you believe in the player, make the pick. No doubt. Make the pick, get your guy, and then let's flip and go Broncos. And the nice thing about Bo Nix is we've seen him in multiple systems. Everyone thinks mm-hmm. Oregon, but he also transferred. So you have multiple yeah. film. And I'd hate to bring up Russell Wilson because he's different from Russ, but it's like we saw Russ at two different teams that had two different mm-hmm. schemes. And the way he ran the offense, it's good to see. I, I like to see a player grow and develop and then wonder – What's left? Maybe his ceiling isn't as high as, let's say, Jaden Daniels, right? Out, astronomical mm-hmm. ceiling. But you know, level-wise, Mace, I think he could start week one. Yeah. He probably, if you compare him to J.J. McCarthy and Drake May, he may not have the same ceiling as those two long-term, but short-term, who's the most likely to be ready? It's Bo Nix. And now that we're having a conversation here, again, could change. You could bring in Ryan Tannehill, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo to be a bridge. Those are names that are still out there. However, if it's status quo, if it's Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci and you throw Bo Nix in there, is there a real shot that Bo Nix could be your week one starting quarterback? Yes, there is a real shot. There are probably some things that Bo Nix is going to step right in and do better than Jared Stidham. Like, mm-hmm. Now, Stidham can run a rhythm and timing-based offense, but as we saw especially in the Raider game, the accuracy wasn't there for Jarrett Stidham in the way that it appears to be there with Bo Nix. And by the way, that accuracy is why occasionally, I know Field Yates of ESPN mentioned this briefly when he was on with Marshall Reff and Mike Evans on 104.3 The Fan on Thursday morning. That is why the name Drew Brees does come into the conversation um, Field Yates's quote, and Yates was at the Oregon Pro Day on a, when, uh, earlier this week, was, quote, when you squint, you see some Drew Brees in him, unquote. Not saying he's uh, apples for apples, but that there are some traits there. Yeah, and everyone's going to look great at a Pro Day, okay? Mm-hmm. So we'll take that. And a Pro Day is like a half a percent of your grade, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But it is nice with boots on the ground from a guy like Field Yates, one of the most respected mm-hmm. guys out there. And we've got three mm-hmm. quotes, three clips here from Field Yates, mm-hmm. one on leadership, one talking about how he's going to impress teams, and one on how he will impress teams. So, mm-hmm. Mace, uh, let's set these up because I think they're very relevant to our conversation about Bo Nix, who could be the Broncos quarterback. Yeah, let's start with the one where he's talking about what he can sell NFL te- where Field Yates is talking about how Bonix will sell himself to NFL teams, and he specifies it's the processing. You have that one? I hope this is the right one, so let's play. I left the Bonix Oregon Pro Day thinking to myself, Bonix is going to go to the pre-draft visits, which are oftentimes the first time that – some coaches, not all, but some coaches get the chance to meet these prospects because obviously they're not on the road during the season and so few teams are sending large contingents of coaches to the combine anymore. And I thought to myself, he's going to make so many coaches such big fans of his because the football intellect is exceptional. Wrong that one. wasn't the one. Wrong one. <laughs> As it's rolling, I, I'm doing the, the family feud. Survey says... <laughs> How about this one? This is the one I'm pretty sure because they're the ones on leadership, but this one is the one too. And again, I think it's very 
juicy here. He told me after the pro day that the trait that he thought maybe could most sell NFL teams is his processing. And that certainly shows up on tape. It's not just being able to put the ball accurately where it's supposed to be, but also knowing in a fast period of time where it's going to go, which can create run after catch opportunities. So I do think that Bo has a pretty clearly defined set of skills. And I do think that's going to appeal to a lot of teams. And if you told me he goes 12th to the Denver Broncos, I would say I buy it. Okay. Bingo. When he says it's the processor, but also quote, knowing in a fast period of time where it's going to go, which can create run after catch opportunities, unquote, run after catch is such a vital trait in the Sean Payton offense. And even though I think we both can agree that Jarrett Stidham isn't the answer, he did set up some significant run after catch chances Mm -hmm. in those two games. He started at the end of the season, most memorably in week 17 on the 54 yard catch and run by little Jordan Humphrey. But he also did that for the since traded Jerry Judy a week later in Las Vegas. So imagine then for a moment, if you can set that up with Marvin Mims Jr. And that's where it gets interesting. And I could see Sean Payton looking at Bo Nix and saying, okay, he doesn't have everything, but Drew Brees didn't have everything either. And Peyton saying, what I want to do, this young man could be able to execute. And also, again, can do it without having to sacrifice draft capital. You you know, I, I know there'd be people at number 12 who'd say, oh, no, don't take Bo Nix. You could get him later. If you've decided he's the guy, don't mess around here. Just yeah. do it. Yeah. Don't so, play the game. It, don't don't do that. Don't say, oh well, maybe, maybe just just take the card up to the podium, mm-hmm. right? Because if you've decided he's the quarterback you want to bring in, do you really want to take that chance that somebody else moves up and gets him before you can get him? Do you want right. to sit there and pins and needles like that? Quarterback is too important to leave it to the whims of the draft. Mm-hmm. Things can get crazy trading down. Yep. On draft day. And I'm not talking Mm -hmm. about the movie Mace. I'll bring up the fact people say football is a game of inches. It's actually a game of angles and the geometry of (laughs) Sean Payton's offense. I'll talk Mm -hmm. about sale concepts all day. Everyone's like, what's the sale concept? Imagine a triangle on the outside. You're just putting two receivers in the realm of three defenders and you're making them move. So when you say run after the catch, and we're talking about run after the catch and Bo Nix and being on time and rhythm and processing, the reason why run after the catch is important because the coach schemes to have the space for the ball to be here Mm -hmm. on time so the defender's back is turned and he has space to run. It's Uh beautiful, man, as I go snowball on us again. Like the NFL, the way offenses are designed, when you're a genius like Sean Payton, you're a guru like Sean Payton, you're setting up because I know this defender's going to drag over here, going to leave this space open. You're creating Uh space to attack Mm -hmm. that space not afterwards hey the guys oh now the guy's in the space no slant god guy makes a cut the ball's in the air before he even makes the cut because by the time he gets he's gonna have a ton of room and the thing is even when you're going against shell concepts space is going to be there i mean it's Mm -hmm. again the process of getting to a point of success is different now than it was a decade and a half ago when you didn't see the same defensive concepts as you see right now Mm-hmm. But the the wonderful give and take of football is that you can't prevent everything. There is no defense schematically, no matter how dominant, that can stop everything. There is a weakness. There's only so much you can do, right? And it's just a matter of finding of finding that and a beautiful thing about this and how it works. If you've got a quality rhythm and timing trigger man at quarterback is that it will take what is conceded to you by coverage. 
Mm-hmm. And that, and we'll keep things on rhythm. So it's, even though conceptually you can prepare for it, it has adaptability to what the ta- what tactics are thrown at you. And then it becomes a matter of the quarterback processing quickly and making the right read. Of course, that being said, the processor, it's the toughest thing to evaluate, as a lot of people in football will tell you. It's yep. the thing that you can't really get a grasp on, especially in a lot of these one-read offenses, which is, w- which is where the questions about Bo Nix come in as well, yes. because yes. a lot of things were set up by quick reads, finding the mismatch, hitting and, and hitting that player in stride. Language is also a barrier as well because college offenses, some guy on the sidelines will have a sign that has a screwball on it. Like, and then that, hey, the screwball guy's on one, ready, break. And there's a lot of concepts. Oregon's guilty of this as well, where every play, it's one guy changes his route. You don't mm-hmm. know which guy changes the route, but it's just one guy. Now, the quarterback will know based on a screwball or whatever. But, like, there's language involved. There's understanding of concepts involved. And that's why processing speed. It's like computers, mm-hmm. man. Give me, a, give me a quarterback with a fast processor. You can win a lot of games. Yeah. Of course, what makes it so hard is, like, the quarterback job description is unlike any other. Not only in sports, it's unlike any other in the world. Because you can have the processor, but if you don't have leadership skills – it's going to fail. Um, on OBT1, we referred to a player who's out there on the market who you can say his leadership skills are lacking, right? Mm-hmm. Do we want to name him? If you watch the show, you'd know. Yeah, Carson, Carson, Carson Wentz, Wentz has had critiques of his leadership, and this is part and parcel of why he's, you know, he's cycled through Teams, he gone from Philadelphia to Indianapolis to Washington to the Rams in short order. He went went from being a franchise quarterback in Philadelphia to journeyman, at, right? And leadership was part and parcel of this for Carson Wentz. And for, I'd almost say even yeah, toxic, yeah. Mace. Like he went yeah. from, you know, starter to, I don't want that guy. Really? Mm-hmm. Think of all the quarterbacks who've gone off the board this week in free agency who you could argue have far inferior resumes. I mean, you could say that Gardner Minshew has an inferior career resume to Carson Wentz. Sure. Gardner Minshew was considered much more desirable on the market and thus was gone like that mm-hmm. to the Las Vegas Raiders. But it's, just, it's a reminder that there's so much involved in the job description, and it's so tough. And that's why we're talking about the processor. We're talking about the accuracy. But it's, it's also about leadership, and that is something that, uh, that, that, that did come up uh, in terms of uh, the discussion of Bo Nix at his pro day. And here's what Field Gates had to say. But I wanted to learn more about the kind of influence that Bo had on that Oregon program for the past couple of years and how that might translate to the NFL level. And I had an an idea of how Bo was regarded, but it was reinforced and strengthened over my time in Eugene of just how much of a leader he was for that program and just how much he commanded the respect of every tentacle of the Oregon football program and really the Eugene community. So I think that it's fair to say the leadership and the football character of Bo Nix is going to be very, very appealing to NFL teams over the next five or six weeks, whatever it is, until the NFL draft. Community as well. That's another thing. It's not just about even the locker room. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about an entire organization, even to some degree a fan base. Yep. Um, you, and this is where personality does matter. Um, there have been some polarizing personalities at quarterback for the Broncos, mm-hmm. you know, that or that led to polarizing notions in the fan base. I mean, Russell Wilson would be polarizing, right? Certainly, yeah. Um, Tim Tebow was certainly polarizing. Mm-hmm. Um, would you say Drew Locke was polarizing? 
just because his stands were so like crazy, like he could he mm. could make it. Like he needed rehab. He needed Seattle. But that wasn't him, though. No, no. I mean, I think guys loved him. Guys loved him. Yes, exactly. Whereas with you know with you know I, I remember with Tim Tebow to go back like to 2011, the notion that okay this guy is working harder than everybody else, it didn't always settle well with some guys in the locker room that year. They're working because. Hard too. Yeah, it's like, and the show of it rubbed some players the wrong way. Like, as I remember one guy being like, hey, he's not the only one who's here at six o'clock in the morning, right? You know, think of, think of what we've seen and learned about Broncos players and teams over the years, for example, such as, you know, the defensive backs in the no-fly zone days. You know, th- those dudes were there at, you know, 615 630 in the morning watching extra film right you know they'd go to the cat they'd go down and grab something from the team cafeteria or one of the dudes would bring in like donuts or bagels or whatever and they'd sit there and they'd sit down to get more film in right yep. so that's the thing like it's leadership it's got to be natural it's got to be authentic but it's got to be leadership that responds to a great many personalities. I basically say a quarterback to some degree has to be Ferris Bueller because you remember in Ferris Bueller's day off when Grace Ed Rooney's secretary is explaining to, to Ed how all the cliques love Ferris. Mm -hmm. They adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. (laughs) I have to do a little bit higher pitch. It's that it's that Midwestern thing. Oh, they all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. Yeah, righteous dude. Don't you know? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't quite a Minnesota accent, but like it's that you know, it's that kind of Midwest, uh, that upper Midwest kind of sing songy thing, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And she and she did it in uh, Edie McClurg was the actress. She did it in um, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles as well when she played the car rental. You know, right, right. Eh. Welcome to Marathon. May I help you? <laughs> Speaking of righteous dude, uh, Jerry Judy thinks he's where he's wanted now in Cleveland, which, hey, they traded for him. They're going to pay him mm-hmm. a bunch of money. Yeah, they do kind of want him. That's why they traded for you, Jerry. Yeah. Broncos want him at one point. Sure. Want him very much. Took him number 15 overall. Um, it's funny because like you see some headlines out there that, oh, he's taking a shot at the Broncos. I think that's a poor way of putting it. Is he happy to be gone and moving on? I think he's more it's specific that he's happy about a fresh start. I don't necessarily think it's like, oh, well, Cleveland's amazing. Darren versus terrible. I think it's just, it's something different. And he had grown weary of, I'd say, you know, some of it was the quarterback play. You know, remember when he uh, was talking about the film last year, you know, said the film don't lie. Mm-hmm. And you know what? He was getting open. Like, I mean, in his oh, defense, yeah. you watch the film. Uh, there's a, There was a point. Like, I, I think Jerry Judy has become kind of, it's, it's funny how Jerry Judy in, in some circles has become public enemy number one around here. If you watch the film, I, I watch the film, I see a guy getting open. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's not always the primary read, but I think, but he's, you know, he's in space. He should be, a, you know, he should be an option. So I, I get the frustration that's, that's settled in. Could he have expressed himself better or done better by not pulling out the phone and tweeting that he got his conditioning in back in 2020 after the Kansas City game? Absolutely. Absolutely yes. could have done that. Like yeah. Jerry could have handled a lot of things better. I did. You and I talked about this, and I know there are people outside that may agree and that disagree, and that's fine. I did see Jerry Judy acting in a in a much more mature manner over the course of the season, especially after that October after Smith, thing. Yeah, yeah, after the Steve Smith stuff and the way he reacted to that, I did see a different Jerry Judy, a more composed, maturing Jerry Judy. And even though. Bronco fans, you may want your team to win the trade. Um, I will be hoping on a personal level that Jerry Judy does well in Cleveland 
and is able to, as he said in the interview with Brown's Digital Media, be the best version of himself. Yeah. All he did was win at Alabama. All he did in Denver is lose. So the quarterbacks Mm -hmm. getting open, the conditioning, it had to wear on him. And we did see a different Jerry after Steve Smith, like, pretty much embarrassed him Mm -hmm. on national TV. So. Well, the funny thing is, I remember, you know, you know people say Jerry Judy is not mature. You know, this. I, I remember Steve Smith not being mature. I remember Steve sure. Smith, you know, punching. I remember, you know, the whole thing of when he punched Anthony Bright in the meeting room. Mm-hmm. Shoot, seven years into his career, eight years into his career, his eighth season, I saw him punch Ken Lucas in a practice. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, literally, I was on one side of the field. They, were, they went out on the other, and he was suspended the – Last the last two games, the thing with Steve Smith, and I think also with Jerry Judy, Jerry, I mean, he works at his route running craft. He really mm-hmm. does. Yes. And Steve Smith works his tail off as well. Now, what I'd like to see Jerry Judy do is become a little bit more of a master of you know of, of the playbook and everything. But I still think there's some untapped potential there. I'm not saying he's going to become Steve Smith. In my opinion, Steve Smith should be a Hall of Famer. Um, that's, I would, I, I, I it, it, there are so many receivers. There's a backlog there. It's hurting him, but Steve Smith has a hall of fame resume. It's unfortunately why we're going to not probably never going to talk about Rod Smith being a hall of fame because Rod's behind Steve Smith and right. Steve Smith can't, hasn't even gotten in the final 15. So anyway, I digress, but I think, uh, instead of getting upset with what Steve Smith said, I think, um, he'd be wise to listen to some of it as well. Because St- I did Steve say it in an inelegant manner? Yeah, that's the st- that. But that's also Steve. Like he's he's blunt. He'll tell you what he thinks. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think. But I do think that there is there are there there's some of what Steve said that Jerry can learn from, and hopefully he'll apply it. And hopefully also being around Amari Cooper, we know Jerry admires Amari Cooper, fellow Alabama Crimson Tide product very much. I think maybe that'll help Jerry as well. That environment. All right, that's a wrap for OBT2. Again, programming note, I'll be on assignment on Friday. So it's Mace and it's Parker Gabriel, our friend from the Denver Post. I knew Parker was one of us, Mace, when we got to hang out with him uh, a few different stops on the old all-star mm-hmm. road trip. So, yeah, he's good people, man. Good people. Smart he, he, he is. Knows his stuff. Uh, does great work over the Denver Post. And uh, it'll be a good chat tomorrow as we chop up everything from this week. And we'll see if there's some news to talk about uh, bef- between now and then or if it's uh, – status quo and uh we'll be on the lookout who knows if something breaks thursday night you might hear more from us on thursday night i mean <laughs> it's kind of the way this is going right i mean yeah yeah we're waiting uh, we're waiting yes but it in is the meantime, what it is right now you can help us out on youtube and we appreciate your support and helping us grow our youtube channel mace you need to help us by like comment share subscribe hit that notification bell so that you never, never miss, miss a vid. vid. That's right. He's Andrew Mason. You follow him on all the socials at Mace Denver. I'm at Cecil Lammy saying thanks for watching, everyone. OBT is BFD. Stay tuned and stay frosty. <laughs>